Hi, welcome to Checking In with Amy. My name is Amy Goldberg and I'm a nurse and I work for Neighborhood PACE. PACE stands for Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly, that being 55 years of age and older. We service the communities of East Boston, Chelsea, Revere, Winthrop, and Everett, in Malden, Medford, Melrose, Stoneham, and Boston's North End. Because the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center is one company, we also have, as part of the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center, a special program to help with the opioid epidemic which is really now um, a national project of trying to get help out there to everyone. I am delighted to have as my guest today, Marie Trinith. Welcome. Thank you, Amy. So tell me, uh, Marie, what you do at the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center and um, what your position is, your mm -hmm. background, and what department? Okay, um, well, I am the nurse manager of the MAP, which stands for Medication Assisted Pathway uh, Program. Uh, we've been here for three years in East Boston, started January 2015, and um, I have worked in addiction for well over 20 years wow. um, in different facilities and in different ways. Um, I also worked at the East Boston Health Center 10 years ago as the nurse manager in Project Shine. So um, I love the East Boston Health Center and I'm really glad that um, they decided to, to put this program into action. Um, and so, yeah, I am the nurse manager. Um, and so what is MAP? MAP is a medication-assisted treatment program. Uh, we use a medication uh, called buprenorphine naloxone, or as it's known, suboxone, uh, to treat opiate addiction, opiate dependencies. Um, along with behavioral health, um, it has been shown, and many studies have shown that that is the best treatment right now that we have um, for opiate dependence, helping people to move, get off of opiates of any kind um, and to move on with their life. So there's help out there. There we is want help to out there. start by saying that right yes. off the bat. Yes, there's hope and there's help. So how does someone access this MAP program? Um, people can access the MAP program. First of all, they need to be um, a, a patient at the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center. Um, if they're not a patient, they can call up member services and enroll really easy. They get an appointment, see their primary care doctor, uh, let them know what's going on, ask them for a referral to MAP. We get the referral, and then um, within probably within 24 hours to one to two days, we usually get in touch with the patient, have them come in and do a nurse intake, and then we schedule an appointment um, with the Suboxone provider. Not every doctor can prescribe Suboxone. They have to have a special waiver to do so. So we have three doctors that work in our clinic with us. So, um, so Let's talk, everyone's saying it's an addiction to opioids. Yes. So now, uh, if someone out there is not familiar, what it's an, what's an opioid? Let's know what they are, so if you can help me with that. Okay, so an opioid is any, it's um, a chemical substance um, that acts, it, it produces a morphine-like effect on the opiate receptors in our brain. Uh, we all have those in our brain. Um, and it's used for medically for pain relief, basically. Uh, common opioids would be codeine, Vicodin, uh, MS Contin, Oxycontin, Oxycodone, Dilaudid, Duragesic, which is uh, fentanyl in a patch, um, or methadone. Methadone is used for substance abuse treatment, opioid um, dependence treatment, and also for pain management too. So those are the most common opioids that, that you will find prescribed to people. So one thing you just told me right before we started about Medicare patients now. Yes. So I know that this, um, 
this whole epidemic is throughout the country, mm -hmm. all different ages. Mm -hmm. But this was an interesting fact. Yeah, I, I just saw this yesterday. Um, and it, it was a report in, um, I think, The Hill, which is, a, is one of the newspapers. And it's, just, it's telling us that roughly one in three people who receive uh, benefits through Medicare um, the Medicare prescription drug programs received a prescription for opioids in 2016. So one in three people. And about half a million received high amounts of the opioids. So that would tell us that nearly 90,000 people are at serious risk of opioid misuse or overdose. So it, it's it's something that I think when you prescribe these opiates, and there's a need for them, you have surgery, broken leg, right. there is a need for opiate uh, treatment with opioids. Um, but I think that it, it's worthwhile for people to speak with their doctors and um, use it for only a short period of time, you know, and be able to uh, switch over to another acetaminophen or Tylenol or ibuprofen. And now, do they not give as much? They, yeah, now now they're they're very careful, and doctors have become aware and educated about prescribing op opioids. And um, I think that it, your initial script when you first get prescribed an opioid is for a seven day supply. Right. If you get a prescription and it's um, twenty four pills, um, you can ask the pharmacy now that you only want three days worth. Huh. You don't want that big a supply. So, so they will be able to fill it now. This is new uh, for three days instead of say 12 days, at, but you, that's it. You wouldn't be able to get more later. Right. That's the script, you know, okay. which, which keeps people safe. That's right. Yeah. Because yeah. once you're on it, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. they can overdo it. And you know? doctors right now have another tool that they use. Um, it's called the PMP or the Prescription Monitoring Program, which every pres prescription for a narcotic that's written, the doctor should be checking the PMP um, in order to see if there's been another narcotic prescribed and when it was prescribed and how much it was prescribed for to keep people safe. So some patients might go to different doctors. They might to get see different specialists, different doctors who may prescribe prescribe one type of opiate right. and now they're seeing their PCP who wants to prescribe another one or another thing like a benzodiazepine with an okay. opiate, which you have to be careful taking these medications. So now there's together. this like registry. There's a registry That's and great. it's called prescription monitoring program. Okay. Yeah. It's yeah. good to know about. Yeah. Um, so we talked about what opioids are. And then let's talk ab now about the current situation regard regarding opioid use and heroin use in 2017. Yeah, it's, it's a huge problem. Um, I think President Trump just announced that he has declared it a public health emergency. Um, and it's been described as an epidemic. Um, in 2016, there were 2,107 deaths from opioid heroin overdoses. Um, but in the first six months of this year, there has been 978 overdose deaths already, um, and probably more by now. Um, the increase in the fatal overdoses are mostly due to the use of um, f something called fentanyl, which is a synthetic opioid. Um, being um, put into the heroin supply and also the cocaine supply too and other drugs. They actually can make pills that look like oxycodone mm. or Percocet and they sell them on the street but they're actually fentanyl. So um, this drug is basically killing people and fentanyl is a, a legitimate um, pain reliever drug, but it's only used for severe pain, cancer pain, um, things like that. Um, but the chemicals are very easily obtained. They're over the internet, you can buy them. They're coming through Mexico and China, and they're, they're the chemicals that make up this, this um, synthetic opioid. Um, it's a hundred times more potent than morphine. So a very small amount could kill someone. And now people who are already dependent on heroin or addicted to heroin 
really now look for the fentanyl because it's a bigger bang for your buck, basically. And, um, you know, very, very, very more dangerous and potent than heroin, basic heroin, the old heroin that used to be And then the you mentioned another kind of fentanyl. There's a couple of different, they call them analogs. So there's a couple, couple of different um, concoctions of this. But the one that's been around and maybe in um, uh, the middle America, but there's been some overdose deaths in um, New Hampshire, it's called carfentanil. Now carfentanil is about a thousand times more mm. potent than fentanyl. So, which is now a hundred times more potent than heroin or morphine. Um, so carfentanil really is used for, by veterinarians yes. to um, when they want to put down large animals, elephants, um, yes. to do surgeries and that. Right. And they have to be, um, they have to have their hands covered, their mouths covered, their clothing covered because it can be absorbed through the skin or through breathing. Right. And we've heard different times on the news of policemen or EMTs that are trying to help uh, people who are overdosing and they start to overdose because they have somehow gotten in contact with fentanyl. So it's very, very dangerous. Yeah. I know. I, I, it's you scary. Know, I've, you know, I've told you when we're alone that this is really the most informative thing that I've heard in yeah. such a long time. Yeah, and people... I, I'm really unaware of yeah, most of many this. many people are because, yeah. you know, I mean, you think of going to your doctors and get a prescription for pain medicine, and, and so people aren't thinking that those kind of things could could get people so addicted that they right. go out and use heroin. Right. You know, heroin is, you know, always thought of as the big bad drug. Now it, it's more common than ever because people can't get the pills anymore. Right. So they go to heroin, yeah, they, which is cheaper. And now it's mixed with this fentanyl and it's very dangerous. Right. Very dangerous. So I'm glad that yeah. you're going to inform us. So, um, so paint a picture of, for me, who is this opioid addict? Okay, Kim, an opioid addict or opioid, opioid is more the pain pills, yeah. the pain medication, opiates are more heroin. Um, an opioid addict can be of any age, sex, income level, education level, it crosses all boundaries race, color, creed. Um, some people will become physically dependent to pain medications, which is a normal thing that happens if you're on them long enough, maybe two weeks or so, you're going to become physically dependent. So you would want to taper off of them right. um, um, to get off of them without having withdrawal symptoms. Um, but and they become physically dependent to the pain medication because they got it due to surgery or in any injury that happens. We've heard of, about a lot of young kids playing football, they break their leg, right. they get in a, a, a script for Percocets and they become addicted to them. Um, so when pain medication is stopped being prescribed without tapering somebody off of it slowly, the person will feel withdrawal symptoms. And I think we, we withdrawal symptoms right. um, are extremely uncomfortable. And this keeps people um, using because they don't want to feel this, this. It's like the worst flu you ever felt. So um, it can include low energy, irritability, anxiety, agitation, insomnia is a big problem that, that people have. Runny nose, teary eyes all the time, hot and cold sweats, goosebumps all the time, yawning, muscle aches and pains, abdominal cramping, nausea, diarrhea, vomiting. And this is because the opiates are leaving the receptor sites in the brain and this is how it affects your body. Um, some people are introduced to heroin, which is cheaper and readily avail available on the street to relieve these withdrawal symptoms. And then they become addicted to the heroin. Mm. You know, they can't stop using the heroin. And some people start experimenting, just experimenting with drugs at an early age with opiates, not realizing 
the high risk of becoming addicted. So kids, you know, um, I'm not sure if they still do this now, but they used to have pill parties. And kids would go in the medicine cabinet and pick out anything and throw it in a bowl and everybody would take it. Uh, not realizing that very quickly they're going to become dependent on it and start feeling some of these withdrawal symptoms. In this past Saturday, we just had a take back, take -back um, program. Yeah. And you go to the local police station. Yeah, mostly And just station. there's no questions no asked. No questions asked. You so can throw all of your unused meds in there. They need to do that. People they need, need to, to do, do that. that. They usually, like Saturday, they have the take back day, but yep. it can be done any day of the week. Okay. They're always there. And that is a good thing. It gets them out of the house, right. out of hands of somebody who might um, unintentionally misuse right. them or Going want to, to misuse grandma's, them. Uh, Into grandma's <laughs> cabinets, auntie's cabinet, yeah. you know, things th that happens. That happens, right. yeah. So um, I think knowing all the signs and symptoms of opioid withdrawal can definitely help um, a parent or a family member Absolutely. really um, help somebody. The, the, those are signs that there's something seriously yep. going on right. and that the person needs help. So how can, um, how can this be prevented? Let's talk about medications <clears throat> and to treat Yes. Oh, now we want it, the one thing I want to do today is to just pay it forward and reach out and try to save a life, mm -hmm. one life. Right. If we could do this program and save one life, Absolutely. it would be fantastic. So let's talk about medicines that are available. Okay. So the medicine that we use at MAP um, is called Suboxone. Well, there is a, a form of it called Subutex, which is only given to pregnant women because Suboxone is made up of two medicines, buprenorphine and naloxone. And in pregnancy, the naloxone may have an effect on the fetus, so they only use Subutex. And that's the only way someone mostly will be able to get prescribed that. Right. And it's monitored very closely. Um, and then do you want to just show us... Um, you brought like an yeah. example of what that would look like. Yeah. So Suboxone, it's office-based treatment. You can get it through a primary care doctor who has a special waiver to be able to prescribe Suboxone. It's called like an X number. Um, it relieves opiate withdrawal and reduces cravings to use opiates. So it helps people to, and, and many of my patients will say, I feel normal now. Okay. I feel normal. Um, it comes in oral tablets, which are generic now, and they're usually orange, but sometimes white. And also they come in film. And the film is called Suboxone Film. And this is um, what that film looks like. It's a little, looks like a Listerine strip. Okay. Uh, people call it film or strip. And it's put under the tongue and it's dissolved it dissolves pretty quickly, has a little bit of bitter taste to it. Um, and they take that. It depends on uh, the dosage that the doctor prescribes. Um, it can be 2, 4, 12 milligrams, 60 milligrams. And they take that daily to help them. And that, along with behavioral health treatment, counseling, right. substance abuse treatment, they really have a that chance at life. That goes hand in hand. Yes, has it hand in hand. Yeah. And... Um, the thing about the Suboxone and um, buprenorphine is that a person must be in opiate withdrawal to be able to start the medicine. Okay. So they, they are not able to use any opiate, any opiate, uh, 12 to 24 hours before taking Suboxone. Uh, because if they do, if there's still Suboxone, if there's still opiates on their receptor sites in their brain, the Suboxone is very strong, binds very closely onto those opiate receptor sites, and it will kick off anything else that's there. And so it, it covers those receptor sites partially, which means that they don't get high from Suboxone. They get relief. From the withdrawal but symptoms. But you make sure that someone does yeah, not have they to... have to be feeling uncomfortable when they come into the office okay. to start the Suboxone, which is tricky to get to. That's right. Um, yeah, yeah. And another, medica another medication we had talked about is methadone. Yes, methadone has been around for a long time. Methadone can only be given in a... It's, um, it's um, monitored by the federal government, so it can only be given for uh, addiction treatment in a clinic, in a methadone clinic. Um, it also works 
almost the same as Suboxone. Um, it relieves opiate withdrawal and craving, the same thing. It also can be used for pain management too. It's a very good pain management um, uh, opiate. Um, they're federally regulated outpatient clinics. It's very structured program. They have to go daily to receive the medication, and it's usually in a liquid form. And they drink, they um, get their dosing according to what uh, the physician they see prescribes for them. Uh, daily dosing, and I think they go into weekly counseling most of the time. Um, usually, if it's prescribed for pain, it's through a pain management clinic. Okay. That's how that works. But burns. someone doesn't stay in a clinic. I mean, it's outpatient? Outpatient, yeah. Okay. They go, usually they go early in the morning, you know, get their dose and go on. Okay. And go on. It works very, very, very well. All of these medications work very well when the patient is truly motivated to not use, um, to not use drugs or, out, well, drugs um, to get on with their life. Um, many people who start these, these medications go back to school, they get a good job, they're with their family again. It really provides a, a pathway to get back to life. That's great. And then you mentioned another two. There's another medication. Um, it's called naltrexone or Vivitrol. Naltrexone is the pill form of this medication. It's non-addictive. Um, it can prevent relapse to opiates um, or alcohol also. It's also used to treat alcohol. Um, it reduces the urge and the effects of alcohol when taken for alcohol dependence. Um, Vivitrol, which is a form of the naltrexone, is a monthly injection. So a person will come to their, it can be prescribed through their primary care doctor because it's not a narcotic medication. There's no withdrawal from it when they stop. Um, it just blocks. So, so when you get the injection for Vivitrol, it lasts in your system for about 28 days to 30 days, um, and it blocks the effects of any opiates. If you used, you are not going to feel anything from it. Okay. You know, so it's a good um, it's a good thing to use to prevent relapse if you have stopped using. Right. Yeah, and. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about common risks for opioid overdose. Mm. Um, <clears throat> what? Just tell me a little bit about those. Some risks for opiate overdose are people who have had an overdose before. So if that, if you've overdosed in the past, you're at high risk to overdose again. Mixing substances is a very real way of overdosing, especially mixing opiates with benzos, very dangerous, or high amounts of alcohol too. Um, you have a history of addiction or substance use disorder. Um, if you've been abstinence for a certain length of time and you start using again, that's a very high risk of overdose yeah. because your tolerances go down. And as your tolerance goes down, you think that you can use like you did before, but you really can't. Yeah. Um, release from incarceration if you've been in jail or prison for a, a period of time and you're released um, on and you think that you might be able to start using again that's a high risk of overdose uh, if you've completed a detox um, because your your tolerance has gone down at that point relapse of any kind mm -hmm. if you've relapsed with drugs chronic medical or mental illness can lead to relapse and overdose uh, depression and anxiety no, are not treated can lead to relapse. Uh, social isolation, if you're, you know, isolation is a big issue with many people with substance use disorder. Um, and if they start using, they're alone. Right. And that's a danger. And using alone, just using right. alone is a danger. So now this final part of let's save a life here mm -hmm. is Tell me some of the signs and symptoms of an overdose. What are we looking for? Okay, so you may know somebody who's using opiates or heroin or, or someone even on the street. Uh, lots of times people uh, use in public bathrooms. So you can, you know, come across at any time somebody who is um, overdosing. They're usually down on the ground. Um, you go over to them. You try to wake them up. You call their name or call a name, kind of shake them a little bit. They do not wake up. 
um, even if you're shaking them and calling their name. They have slow or no breathing at all. Uh, they may become blue around the mouth, their fingernail beds. Um, they get a, like a gray or pale skin color. Very tiny, small pupils. Their pupils are very small. Or you hear a gasping, snoring sound. Um, and those are signs of an overdose, an overdose. So now we want to reverse it. So immediately you call 911. Okay. You t call 911, say that you're with somebody who's not breathing. Um, if you can, sometimes if you're not, you're getting your, if you have Narcan, you're getting it ready, some, you or another person you're with, you might want to give some rescue breaths, which would be one breath every five seconds. Um, you want to make sure they're laying down flat. You try to give them maybe a breath if you have time. Um, then you, if you have your Narcan with you, you want to administer the Narcan. This is the Narcan that's prescribed most often now. It's four milligrams. In the past, we had two milligram vials, which now we're finding is not enough. Um, these packages, very, very simple. You just tear down the pack. You take it out. There's no cover to undo, nothing. And then you want to spray this whole up, this whole dose one on, in one nostril. And this medication, it will work within two to three minutes. If it doesn't work, then you, you, there's two in a package. You want to open up the other one and get, with, after two, three minutes, you want to give them the other one. And ho hopefully they're coming around at that point. Now the thing with fentanyl uh, is that it would, it could, it depends on how much a person has used, it could take more than two of these. So hopefully by then, the EMTs are there. So the Narcan will last about 30 minutes um, to help somebody stay awake. Um, it does not reverse overdose from any other drug like a benzo or alcohol or cocaine. It doesn't reverse it for that, only for opiates. So what it does, it pushes it off the receptor site so breathing starts again. Um, and if you know, you've given them the two things of Narcan, EMTs aren't there yet, I would say give them rescue breaths until they do get there because they're losing oxygen to their brain. So even if they come out of it, they could be brain injured. So you might be able to And then that. you said you, um, when we spoke that you shake them, do you do something so, with your hand? Yes. Yeah, so, so if you've called their name, you kind of shake them, they're not responding, you can rub them. It's called a sternum, uh, sternum rub. And you rub really hard right here, and that hurts. So if they're going to come out, they're going to come okay. out in that way. If not, then they're, they're pretty much overdosing. Okay. Yeah. And then we have a card here that you showed me that you can get... The Narcan. Narcan is available at all pharmacies, any pharmacy, without a prescription. So anybody can walk in and say, I'd like a Narcan kit. And the pharmacist will probably go over it with you okay. um, and show you what it's about. But um, they may charge your insurance and, and ask for a co-payment, and they may not. Okay. You know, but there, it's available at all pharmacies, so anybody can get that. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think that this is a huge, valuable lesson for everyone today. Yes. Yeah. So, first of all, thank you oh, for, you're welcome. for teaching me yeah. so much about this that I knew nothing about. Yeah. And to teach the viewers. Yes. So if we could possibly save one life, absolutely, it would make, you know, make I the world a better place. Mostly everybody knows somebody right. who either is using or has a friend who's using or right. a family member who's using or a neighbor who has a family member. It's everywhere. It is. And, and people, there is treatment and treatment works right. and there is hope. You know, and if you save, the hope with the Narcan is that that person's going to get awake and they're going to want treatment and they're going to want to live after that. I know. You know, and sometimes, sometimes it may take a few times of somebody overdosing and, thank God, not dying right. to be able to get it. But it's a, this disease, um, similar to other chronic diseases like diabetes and hypertension, in that it's a relapsing disease. Right. You know, people can get better and then 
at times they can relapse. So they have to have a lot of support around them right. to, to, be, to um, be able to stay um, in recovery. Right. You know, and recovery is about living. It's not yeah. just about using, it's about living. So, right. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. So thank you for tuning in. I'm really hopeful that you will be able to watch this show pass along the information to anyone that you know that could possibly benefit. Um, the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center, the PACE program, we're all one company and the goal is to pay it forward to keep people healthy, independent, and active in the society today. So if you do want more information about um, our clinic, and so forth, please call the nurse manager, Marie, at 617-568-6260. And until we meet again, please stay well. Thank you. Bye now.